God, we thank you for your faithfulness as we sing. I am holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake praise to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now Amen so thankful and grateful for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, God. Great is your faithfulness. You're so good to us. God, we thank you for all of your God, you're so faithful. You're so true to your word. Forever you will be. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this together. Sing faithful you are sing faithful forever you will be sing it out faithful you are and all your promises are yes and amen sing that out sing faithful you are Yes, you are faithful forever you will be. Oh, faithful you are. Yes, you are. And all your promises are yes and amen. Sing it out. 
Sing faithful you are Oh faithful forever you are Oh faithful you are Yes you are And all your promises are yesterday All your promises And all your Promises and all your promises are yes and amen. Come on, he's good, he's faithful. Let's praise him in this room. Come on, we got more than that this morning. Come on, he's good. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. You're so good to us. <laughs> all right, thank you guys for singing and, and praising him this morning. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Wow. And I'm hot up here. Well, I'm always hot up here, but it's a little... Look, I'm still trying to figure out when Brian goes, uh, you know, go back and see my wife and she'll give you a bag. I'm like, a bag of what? Um, and uh, I'm just curious. And um, so next service, he's going to come in. He's going to be very specific about what's in the bag. So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it could be anything, couldn't it? Hey, uh, we want to welcome you. If you are uh, watching online, thanks for doing that today. And uh, if you're here in the room, if you will take your phones, and if you have the Version Bible app and go down to the menu area and hit events, this will show up. All the notes are there, and you can take notes in it. Um, if you have, there's something profound that is said, um, which we are talking about the, the Word of God, so it should be profound. Um, we are finishing up a series called Naturally Supernatural, and hopefully it's been a stretch uh, for most of us. I know for me, coming from my background as a, as a conservative Baptist, it is a stretch um, to talk about how God works in the, in the supernatural and how he wants to, us to work in the supernatural. We're used to the natural realm, and that's where we live our lives. But yet, um, when God created everything, he created out of nothing, which means even the natural is supernatural and the fact that it is here. And so God has drawn us in to work with him through the Spirit, which again lives in us, which is supernatural, and to function in a supernatural way in this world. And so um, I, I hope that you get that. I think part of it is um, the reason we struggle and we put God in the box that we put him in is because of upbringing. I mean, you know, depending on what background you're in, um, if you come from different denominations, you learn different things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm all for, tra for traditions. I'm all for things like that. But it can create a box that we put God in, and our, our goal is to expand that box, to quit living in ignorance of what Scripture says, but expand our box through theology, understanding more about what God's Word says, which means, by the way, it means you have to read God's Word to actually know what it says. And we're starting a new series next week, which is going to last for a while, um, looking at the spiritual disciplines, which we have forgotten in the church day, which the early church did. We wonder how they did what they did, how they lived the way they lived. It was because their lives were spiritually disciplined. So next week, we're going to talk about how to study Scripture. You know, a simple thing, a lot of us, we know how, but some go, man, when I read certain books of the Bible, it's just boring, and it shouldn't be because God, it's God's Word. It should excite us. And so, um, so through theology, through testimonies, we had testimony last week, which kind of challenged. I'm going to share some things today, which hopefully will challenge you with that. Learning how to do it. We're going to talk at the end. We're going to give you some practical um, stuff as we talk about healing today, some things that you can do, and then just trusting God. Just trusting that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And, and I'm just one who believes if God did it in the Old Testament, he did it in the New Testament, then he's going to do it in us as well if we allow him to. And so today we're going to talk about healing power. And I know for some of us where our antennas go up because we've seen major abuse in this. We have seen people draw attention to themselves in healing. And, and healing is never about attention to us or the pastor who does it or whatever. It's all about God. It's about his power and his glory because everything that happens on this earth for us is to be for his, his glory. So our big idea today is this. Healing prayer is a natural outgrowth of a supernatural relationship with, with Christ. Healing prayer is the natural outgrowth of a supernatural relationship with Christ. So when we go into our prayer team on, on uh, Tuesday night, and I would encourage you to come to the fastest hour and 15 minutes of your week, when we go in there and we sit and we pray, we are, are trying to get to the point where our minds, where we're not saying, I believe, help my unbelief. We just go, God, we know you can heal. 
Why? Because we have a relationship with him. We trust him more and we trust that he can do all things. There's nothing that's outside of God's power. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Now, in the Bible, there's healing in the Bible. We know that, right? And in fact, when we go to Genesis chapter 1, it says this, God saw all that he made and it was very good indeed. Evening came in the morning of the sixth day. And so he said, God created everything. He said, man, it's very good. And and that means that when God created everything, there was not a place for sickness or death or anything like that. I mean, there was no um, injustice. There was no brokenness. And he says, very good. And we sit here in our world today and we go, it's very bad, right? I mean, why? Why If God created it very good, why is it so bad? Because... While God meant for us to flourish and God meant for us to live side by side, men and women as partners, it's stewarding the earth and moving things forward, we decided we want to do it our way. We, we like our way, don't we? Everybody in this room, you go, no, no, I'm, 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 the, I'm one of the nicest, most easygoing people in the whole world. Um, for those of you who are married, let's just step back the first, I don't know, year of your marriage. When you realized, which was the hardest thing for me, was realizing I am a selfish rear end. I may be nice to all of you, and I may, be, I may give to all of you, but when it comes to my family, the hardest thing for me was to realize with my wife in those first couple months of marriage just how selfish I really was and how I wanted my own way. We've always wanted our own way. Which is what happened. We, we decided to have take it our way, do our own thing, and we brought sin and death in the world and, and, and created this broken world that God said was good. And from that time forward, God has been in the process of redeeming and healing that world. In fact, when you look at Revelation, it says, at the end of the book, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and the sea was no more. And I also saw a holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride or adorned for her husband. Now get this. So I read a book years ago. I would encourage you to. It's called Eternal Security by, by um, Charles Stanley. In that he talks about the fact that he believes that God's plan never changed from what the Garden of Eden was supposed to be to the end. And here's what it says in the end of Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. I mean, from the moment man decided we were going to do our own thing and we were going to control things and we were going to take what was good and make it in our image, God has been in the process of redeeming all things to take it back to the way he wants it to be. Sickness was not God's design because God loves to heal. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've had sickness. Sickness is not God's design. And so if it's not God's design, then God wants to change it. And we know in Scripture, Jesus heals, right? We read that. Jesus, Jesus healed. In fact, in, in Matthew, uh, is talking about what J, Jesus did. Matthew chapter 4. So Jesus comes out of the temptation in the wilderness. And here's what it says. Is, now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching the synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom. And we go, oh, yeah, he, he was a preacher, kind of like what I do. But then he said, and he healed every disease and sickness among the people. Healed every disease and sickness. My people go, well, yeah, he was, he was God. You know, he could do that. You know what God does? I mean, he can, he, he can do that. And, and it's interesting because when you read Scripture, you, we, we read just certain stories. I mean, there's just certain little, little pullouts in Scripture of Jesus healing people, but it's implied that he healed hundreds, thousands maybe of people. I mean, it says he healed every sickness and disease. People were being brought to him all the time. And you'll see a glimpse of a blind man or someone else that was healed, but they were bringing him to him all the time. In fact, the Apostle John says at the end of his book, he says that if we took everything Jesus did, we could not, it would fill all the books of the world. In other words, he's saying there was way more than what was listed in Scripture that he did. Why? Because God's heart is to heal brokenness. God's heart is to fix and take things back the way it was supposed to be. That's his heart. 
And on top of that, the healings were signed for the people of who Jesus was. Did his message match up with who he said he was? I mean, what good is a Savior? What good is a someone who comes and says, I'm the Messiah, and they just sit there and talk about, I'm the Messiah? It's kind of like this. What good is it if you and I say we're believers, and all we say is we're believers? I mean, is that, does that matter a lick? I mean, because 90% of Americans say they're believers, right? Actually, the number's down a little bit. About 80% say they're believers. They believe in God. And, and yet, today, probably only about 20% of Americans are in a church anywhere. And now the 20% of their church, probably about 40% have no relationship with God whatsoever. So does it really matter what we say? So Jesus said I'm the Messiah, but then the miracles, they backed it up. And I, I would just tell you that we're called to be like him. And so our words have to be backed up with our actions. Our actions prove. That's why James said faith without works is what? Dead. Our, our actions prove that Jesus has power, proves that he is who he says he is. But he wasn't just a healer. It wasn't just like he, he healed. The healing was just a sign of what God was doing, that God was doing something new. And every miracle he did proved his kingship. And then get this, so Luke 9, 9 verses 1 and 2 says this, Some of the twelve he gave them power. <laughs> gave them a power and authority over the demons and the healed diseases, and then he sent them to proclaim the king of God and to heal the sick. In other words, Jesus didn't just leave it there and say, it's mine to do. He looked at his disciples, this ragtag group of people that none of us would have chosen. You know how, how I know that? Because we sit there and think, well, that person, man, they're popular. Or they're a good athlete. Man, if they just come to the Lord, everybody's going to listen to them. And Jesus didn't choose those guys. I mean, he chose fishermen. You know the thing about fishermen? Their fingers always smell like fish. They could not get that smell off their fingers probably their entire life. He chose tax collectors. How many of you just a month ago said... Man, I get to write a check to the IRS because they're such nice people. Nobody, if you work for the IRS and you're watching online, we love you. <laughs> we just don't like writing checks to you. <laughs> he chose a tax collector. He chose a tax collector and a zealot who, guess what the zealot's job was? To kill tax collectors. He chose this ragtag group of people and said, by the way, guys, I'm going to send you out to heal people too. And I get it. I get, you know, our, our objection is, well, God, you don't know how screwed up I am. I just can't, I can't go do that. And all we're asking in this series, we're not, we're not trying to make healers of all of you. We're saying open yourself up to the possibility that God can do more through you than you're allowing him to do. Open yourself up to the possibility that maybe you're missing a dimension of the Christian life, like we talked last week about prophecy and just encouraging one another. I'm not talking about going, all right, the world's going to end tomorrow. I'm talking about just if God lays somebody in your heart today to go over and, and talk to in the, at the end of the service, then you go do it because God's telling you to do it and not worry about what they say. I mean, we're saying open up a dimension of yourself and maybe healing is a dimension that God wants you to open up because we've got people in this place that need to be healed. Well, we're praying for them. And so in the... In, in the in the, when you get to Acts, you start seeing the apostles who were not, or the, the, the apostles and Paul, they're going out and they're, they're healing people. I mean, they're doing some crazy stuff like, like walking by and a shadow and somebody's healed. <laughs> or I love this one. There was this one dude that was um, listening to a sermon <laughs> like this, and he was sitting in a windowsill and he got sleepy. That's why we have coffee out there, so y'all stay awake through the whole sermon. Um, he got sleepy and got so tired, he fell out of the window and died. I mean, that shows that kind of, Paul was not Stephen Furtick or one of those guys. Paul was, Paul was probably dry as dirt, I think, because, because the guy fell out, just died. And Paul goes down there and goes, hey, get up. And he got up. I mean, they were doing stuff like this 
all the time seeing people change. I mean, it was just, this was just an ordinary occurrence in the early church. It's not even like anybody went, oh, okay. I mean, there's only one time that, that I remember, and that you could probably find others, where, where something happened where, the, where people were kind of freaked out about it, other than the resurrection. There was, there was a point where, where the apostles were in prison, and they're praying that, that they'd be released, and Peter's released, and he comes, and he's knocking on the door. The woman opens the door. Oh, yeah, we're praying for him. Slams the door in his face because she thought it was a ghost or something. For the most part, all these things were stuff that happened all the time. And I sit there and I go, why in the world doesn't it happen today? Why is it just to, to, to us? It's, it's either just a New, uh, New Testament occurrence that ended at the, time, at the end of the apostolic age, or when we watch TV and we see some preacher up there slinging his coat around, everybody falling out, we go, there's no way God can heal. Why, why is it that we, it's, it's an either or. It's, it's like, I don't, I, don't under, I don't understand that because here's what Jesus said in John 14, 12, which is for us, it's for you. It's for me and you. It says, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. He will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. And we read that and go, no way Jesus can use me to heal somebody. Isn't that, isn't that us? Because I promise you right now, as I preach this, and, I, and I've been talking about this, I'm in this position where I'm saying, Father, I believe, help my unbelief. And there's some of you right now, you've already written this off as this is, this is nuts. There's no way God can ever heal or ever use me. Then you got a problem. you got a problem because if you think that, then what you're saying is that Jesus is a liar. So you can't have it both ways. We like it both ways. And so either Jesus was honest and, and what he's saying is you can do greater things or he's lying. There's no, no middle ground. And we read as we've read through this whole thing that he wants to do exceedingly more than we could ever hope for or begin to imagine. And, and that's the greater thing. I found myself kind of trapped between those two things. I remember, and Brian's going to talk about Mission Serve here at the end of the service and the opportunities we have there. But we did a project, um, it's probably about 12, 13 years ago, right back across here in the upstairs of uh, the Fellowship Hall at Fuquay Baptist. And um, we did worship there. And that, that project, there were 450 students. And I remember we did the concert of prayer, similar to what we did a couple weeks ago, which, by the way, we had people laying hands on people and people having pain go away, just so you know. Um, just some really cool things happening that night. Um, and it was not manufactured. It's just somebody said, hey, let me go. Let me go pray on it for you. And the way we had it set up is the room, we had a stage and we had a, a big screen so that the band couldn't see what was going on. So they couldn't play to the emotions of the crowd. And all it was was scripture, singing, and prayer. That was it. And I knew something was happening about five minutes in, literally five minutes in, when we start doing it. And all of a sudden, we start having kids and adults coming up the front and just falling on their face praying. And then I have some student. I'm, I'm back over with my students. I decided I wasn't going to lead that night. I just wanted to enjoy the night. And I'm, I'm back over in the back, and the student comes up and tugs my, my shoulder and says, hey, I need Jesus. I'm like, well, you ain't my youth group. Go find your youth pastor. You know, that was my thinking right there. And I got to share Jesus with this kid. And we had like seven or eight people to the point where about six years later, I was up at Lifeway when Lifeway was still open. This kid comes up and says, do you remember me? I'm like, no. I mean, I know a lot. Yeah, I was a youth pastor for 30 years. I don't remember everybody. I've done these mission projects. And he goes, I was in that room that night. He said, I was back on the back right side because I wasn't even supposed to be on the project. I just came as a last-minute thing. And as I was sitting there, God got in my life. I just gave my heart to the Lord. I didn't come far. I didn't talk to my youth pastor till later. But he said, I want you to know something. He said, I'm working with a Christian ministry now, um, doing car shows and sharing the gospel every weekend. But that wasn't even the craziest thing. So we're sitting there praying. About the time that student came up to me, I hear the screaming back over my left shoulder. And... Um, I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, the Baptist in me goes, yeah, here we go. <laughs> I did, I've done enough youth camps to know that you can get emotion out of anything, okay? 
Um, and, and like I said a couple of weeks ago, I can make all of you cry right now if I took my shirt off and you would all cry. And even I thought about maybe just swinging around, see if we heal anybody as I did that. Um, and, and some of you, it wouldn't heal you. Your eyes would go blind. But, um, but I hear that over my shoulder and I'm going, oh, golly, all right, how do we deal with this? And somebody, this adult comes up and goes, hey, 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 you got to know, um, we had a girl get healed. Well, I wish I'd done that. But the skeptic in me goes, mm. so she's telling me the story. She said we were, this young girl didn't have hearing in her left ear. It had gone. And they were praying over her for healing. And that youth leader was praying on that left shoulder. And the girl started screaming when she all of a sudden started hearing out of that left ear. They're like, man, we got to tell everybody. And I'm like, yeah, let's find out. Let's wait. It's crazy because I believe in healing. I do. But then when something like that happens, the skeptic jumps in. And I'm going, yeah, let's wait. Now, I got word back later that the girl went to the audiologist and they said she can hear and we can't explain it, which means, guess what, that's probably a miracle. And, and, I, and I regret the fact that I should have at that moment brought them up and celebrated and said, look what God can do. And instead, I was happy for the people who gave their heart to the Lord, but the opportunity to see God back up what was happening with his power, I blew it. I mean, we see we serve a God who, who can and does heal, and yet at the same time, he doesn't heal everybody, and so we become skeptics. That's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and that's the problem. So people either they either conclude that God is real because he heals or conclude that God is false because he doesn't heal. So before we jump into just the, the how-to or the tactics, I, I just want to give you something because God didn't heal everybody in Scripture. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4.20, it's, Paul says, Erastus has remained in Corinth and I left to Themis sick in Miletus. In other words, even somebody who was a Paul didn't get healed. In fact, Paul, you find in Scripture three times he prayed for healing. We don't know really know what it is. It could be his eyes or stomach or whatever. Prayed for healing and God didn't heal him. And here's Paul who didn't get healed. And God looked at him and said, just know, just so you know, I'm not going to heal you because my grace is sufficient. God doesn't already heal. So, so when did Jesus not heal? Because there are times Jesus didn't heal. He may have healed thousands, but there were times he didn't. Let me just give you three things. Three, Things where Jesus didn't do miracles. First of all, Jesus refused to do miracles to prove himself. He didn't do miracles to prove himself. He, he didn't want to be this trick pony where he goes, hey, Jesus, do another trick. In fact, you remember when he went before Herod, before he died, Herod goes, show me something. Well, what would he have done? If he had done anything, then Herod still, he still would have gone to the cross. Or if he didn't go to the cross, that's a problem for us. And it says in, in Mark 8, it says, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding him a sign from heaven to test him. And sighing deeply in the spirit, he said, why, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. So there were times that Jesus didn't do a miracle. He didn't heal because he wasn't going to do it just to show, just as a, as a, a, to do a trick for somebody. He just didn't because, you know, even it, I mean, do you really think this when he's on the cross, he said, they said, hey, if you'll come down off the cross, we'll believe in you. Do you think they would have believed? No, because he did miracles and what do they say? Oh, they're from Satan. Wouldn't have done any good. Second, Jesus never performed miracles that interfere with God's ultimate plan. That one gets me. Because I think I know God's ultimate plan for me, but then I found in my life I really don't. I mean, you see Jesus do in, in one story in Matthew, you see Jesus do a miracle and not do a miracle. In the same story, it's crazy. So you remember um, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and... Um, and the soldiers come to get him, and Peter, who decides, man, Jesus, I'm never going to deny you, but I'm going to you know, stand right by you. And Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me. Well, Peter had a sword. And when they came up, Peter, who was obviously not very good with a sword, he was a fisherman, he takes a sword, and he basically misses Malchus's head, but cuts his ear off. 
Peter, put the sword away. Man, what are you, have you lost your mind, dude? And Jesus casually, anybody see an ear? Hey, bring that torch over here. I can't see that ear. Picks the ear up, puts it back on. And then he looks at Peter and he says this. He says, or do you think that I cannot call my father and he will provide me here and here now more than 12 legions of angels? How then would Scripture be fulfilled that says it must happen this way? He goes, when he had an opportunity to walk away, which we saw. You remember when he's in Nazareth? And he's up there and he, he says, today Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they try to throw him off a cliff. It says he just walked through. Just part, just walked through. He could have done that again, but it would not have fulfilled God's plan that he die so he can rise again so that we can have eternal life. And so he did a miracle, but he didn't. Why? Because had he done the miracle of calling the angels down, you and I would not be here right now. He never does miracles that interfere with his ultimate plan. You know what bothers me, though? What bothers me is for a lot of us as Christians, we say some things to people when they're not healed that I think are just insensitive or dumb or dumbly insensitive. It may be well-meaning, but it's hurtful. It's like, you know, the reason that you're not healed, and we're going to talk about faith in this, because you lack faith. Or the reason that you're not healed is because of sin in your life. Or, or maybe you're not praying right. You're not having a, the right conversation with God. And it may not be any of those things. It may not be any of them. It may just be that God's plan is different. When my brother died, we prayed that God would heal him, and God chose not to heal him the way we want him healed. My brother's prayer was way different than my prayer. His prayer was that he would finish his day strong and they would make an impact for Jesus. That's why there were 1,200 people at his funeral and why people came to the Lord at his funeral. I'm praying God save him, God heal him, God do this. God healed him. And my brother understood something I didn't when he wrote me a letter before he died and said, I can't wait to see what God has next. I'm like, idiot, don't you know you're about to die? But he saw the bigger picture. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I think I've told you this. He said something that was so stupid, made me mad. He said, maybe God, sometimes God has to take somebody out of your way so you can become what you were meant to be. You know, 12 years later, I look back and I'm a different person because of him, because he died. And I think I would not be who I am if he were still here. Third thing is this, Jesus didn't do miracles where there was no faith. He goes to his hometown, goes to Nazareth, and he's, everybody, he's, he's wanting to do miracles. But it says, and, and Matthew says, he did, he did not do any, many miracles there because of unbelief. People just didn't believe him. They go, oh, isn't that isn't that isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't that, didn't we see little Jesus grow up? And he's going to come and he's going to do miracles. They, they, he couldn't. But yet faith moves the heart of God. Faith moves the heart of God. Trust in God. Trust in God even when he doesn't heal the way you want to heal you. I mean, that's the question. If he doesn't heal you, are you still going to trust him? That's, I mean, that's, yeah, it does hurt. But that's the question. Because you see stories where faith, I mean, is, you remember the, the, the woman that was bleeding? Like for years, bleeding, couldn't, wouldn't stop. And there was a problem with that because it meant she was kind of an outcast. And, and she just thought, man, if I can just touch Jesus, I'll be healed. And he says, daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. She went and touched his robe. And what did he say? Touching my robe healed, healed you? Oh, yeah, you did the right thing. You touched my robe. No, he says, your faith healed you. How about this one? There was a man that had leprosy, and he was going to die. And it says that he came, and he fell at Jesus' feet, and he worshiped. And here's what Jesus says, and Jesus told him, get up and go your way. Your faith has saved you. Not your worship. Your faith has saved you. There was a blind man sitting there just calling out to Jesus. He's calling out, son of God, God, do something. Jesus looks at him and goes, go, your faith has saved you. Or how about this one? It's crazy. It's Roman centurion who has a servant. 
And he says, hey, Jesus, can you heal my servant? Jesus, yeah, I'll come to your house and heal him. He goes, no, you don't need to come. You don't need to come. I, I understand authority. I'm one with authority. And, and I tell my soldiers to go where they go, and they do what I tell them to do. And I know that you can do the same thing. And listen to what Jesus said. And hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those fallen, Truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. In other words, faith moves the heart of God. And where there is no faith, God doesn't move. But again, when we trust God, we got to trust that what he's doing is for our good, for our best. And that's hard. Can you trust God even if the answer isn't what you want it to be? You can, I, I know, because that's me. You know, I still have pain from injuries. I live with pain. But I look at it this way. It's a reminder how far God has brought me. I was paralyzed from the shoulders down. A little pain is not a big deal. Just not. So I want to end with this, just next couple minutes. We have about 11 minutes. I want you to, we know God heals. We know it's God's plan. We know that God uh, wants his best. But what I want you to grab hold of is that God wants to use you in this process. And to open up and expand the possibility, expand your box that God can do more than you can hope for or imagine. And I get it. My prayer through this whole series has been the same as the father whose son is rolling around in fire. And Jesus says, do you believe? And he says, I believe, help my unbelief. That is a fair prayer. And there are going to be others that tell you that if you don't totally believe, you're in trouble. There's a problem there. There's a problem because Jesus healed that boy, that father's son. Even with not full, total understanding and belief. But what happens is when God heals there, because I can tell you that my, my thought process on healing changed after that mission serve incident. To where now when I see it happen somewhere else, I don't go, eh, whatever. I try not to be as, as skeptical. It still creeps in sometimes. I mean, the book of Acts, man, there's... We see healing. We see how God used people. In Acts chapter 3, it says that there's this lame guy, or this guy begging, he's been lame, and he thought he was going to get something from Peter. And Peter says, but gold and silver I don't give you, or gold we don't have, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Now, now I, I, as, as I'm sitting there reading that, I'm going, all right, get up and walk. So if the guy doesn't get up and walk, is he going to be healed? Faith, right? Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up at once. He, he, he was on his feet and his ankles became strong. So he jumped up and he started to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And so Paul, God did this incredible miracle with this guy using the apostles. Jesus is gone, using the apostles. And it was not just an opportunity to change this man's life. That's the thing we got to get in our minds about about. Healing. It's not just changing their life. It's about shouting the greatness of God because there's a beautiful opportunity there to share who Jesus is. Because in, later in that chapter, it's by faith in his name, uh, his, this man was made strong, in whom you see and know. It says, so the faith that comes through Jesus has given him his perfect health in front of you all. In other words, what happened was everybody knew this guy. Like in that youth group, everybody knew that girl. And knew her story. And all of a sudden, when that changed and she could hear, everybody's going, oh my gosh, look what God did. And here's everybody seeing this guy begging in front of the temple. Everybody knew him. And now all of a sudden, he's healed. And it's not just about him being healed. It's about the greatness of God. So now everybody's going, oh my gosh, in the name of Jesus, that happened? You even find it's crazy. Because then there's some people in Scripture who were not Christ followers who were using the name of Jesus to heal people. Remember, the disciples come and go, hey, Jesus, that guy's not one of us, you know, and they, he's healing people. In the name of Jesus. And so, again, we're just asking you to open up the possibility that God can do something. See, it's our job to love and God's job to heal. Your job's not to heal anybody. It's like I, I hate when people go, I saved 15 people, 15 people I saved now they're in the kingdom. You didn't save anybody. 
I healed somebody. No, you didn't heal anybody. You don't have the power to heal anybody. The better thing is I was obedient and God did something great. That's probably the better thing. So I, I just want to give you real quickly um, just a, a, a method, okay? If you'll open up, just a method, all right? And, and it's, it's a method that goes to the fact that you, you don't know what God wants to do through you, all right? So right now, today, as you sit here, you, you're hearing me, but you don't know what God wants to do with you. I mean, God may have a plan that you are used to heal somebody, and he may have a plan that you're not. Just like last week when we were uh, asking you just to think about, um, you know, speaking encouragement to somebody, if God laid them in your heart, guess what? God didn't lay anybody on my heart. And I didn't go manipulate it and go, well, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to lay hands on I'm the pastor. I've got to go do it because i got to set the example. I didn't do it because God didn't lay that on my heart. God may or may not use you here, but how do you know Unless you do something, right? So let me, let me just give you, um, going back to our prayer ministry and, and what we're doing there, let me just give you four things. And it's just an acronym for HEAL. The first thing is ask people how you can pray for them. Does that hurt? Does that hurt anybody? Just, hey, is there anything I can pray for you? I, I used to work with a pastor, and he didn't do this all the time. He, he was very sensitive to what God was doing in his life. But we'd go to a restaurant, and he would just, the, the waitress would come up. He'd go, hey, we're about to pray and do a blessing. Is there anything we can pray for you for? Sometimes they'd go, yeah, I've got this problem in my life. And sometimes they'd just look at him like he'd lost his mind. You know, either way, we got dinner. Either way, we still, it's not like they go, oh, man, you're a nut. You're not getting food. Well, guess what? You're not getting a tip. Um we still got food. It doesn't hurt to just look at somebody and say, hey, how, how can I pray for you? And some will be receptive to it. And some will share their hurt. And some will say, hey, I, I've got something going on in my life. Second thing is this, explain what you're going to do. And, what I, and, and basically what we're going to do is this. We're just going to um, ask, hey, can I, can I just pray for you? And I just walk over and say, hey, let me pray for you. Just put your hand on their shoulder to pray. Why? Because laying on hands which we don't do very much, is biblical. Just, just uh, two weeks ago, Brian was talking about church plants with the Carolina Movement, which we're a part of. Um, and I'm excited because we just I had a meeting um, on Wednesday with a group that's going to be planting here um, locally that we're going to be a part of. We've been praying that God will send church planters to Fuqua. Everybody wants to go to Raleigh and, and because Raleigh's the new sexy or whatever. And I'm like, but Fuqua's growing, man. We need church planters here, and we've got somebody, so we're excited about that. But we got to lay hands on eight families that are planting church between now and September. One of them is planting at the end of this month, and we're going to be helping with, um, with or getting some equipment that they need so that they can, they can launch. It's down at Ocean Isle Beach. So if you go to Ocean Isle, it's a great place. It's, it's uh, Ocean Isle Beach Community Church. And the, the cool thing is Travis um, is from this area. He grew up in Lillington, worked at Fuquay Baptist back in the, in the 90s, and, um, and just a great guy. And so we get to be a, a part of that. But I say all that to say that, that um, you know, just laying hands is biblical. And we laid hands on those guys and, and their wives and their children as they got ready to go out and do this thing. When we launched this church, they laid hands on us. So there's nothing wrong saying, hey, can I just pray for you and put a hand on their shoulder and, and just pray? Again, it's nothing you're doing because you don't know what God wants to do. Then before you pray, just take a moment and ask God. Just say, God, what is it you want me to say? What is it you're saying right now, God? Because again, it's not about you. It's not about you. And just pray silently and take your time. And then just pray over the person. Just say, God, thank, thank you. I, I, you're a God of love. And I don't know what you want to do in this person's life, but I'm going to ask that you would heal him. And then listen, because they may go, dude, something just happened. Or they may not. Because the interesting thing is sometimes God heals right away. Sometimes it takes time. In my journey, it took, it took six months. But God healed. Doctors can't explain it. 
Um, they told me I wouldn't be able to do things, and everything they said I wouldn't be able to do, I do. Um, and you can go, oh, but your body compensated. No, my body didn't compensate. I mean, you can think that. And it, it, that's a really weird thing. God has healed me from things, and I, and I know it. And then when he goes and wants to heal somebody else, I go, uh, really, God? This is so stupid. I'm... But sometimes God heals right away, and sometimes God heals in a way we don't know. Many of you have heard of the guy, a guy named Tony Campalo. Uh, he was a preacher, um, still a lot, but he was a preacher back in the, pretty big back in the 80s and 90s. Um, did youth camps and things like that. Well, there's a story. He was telling a story about a time this wife comes to him and says, hey, my husband is dying of cancer. Will you come and pray for healing? Because I believe that you can do something. And he goes and he, he prays over the guy, lays hands on him, prays over him. And, and about a week later, he gets a phone call from the wife. And he says, oh, yeah, great. I mean, this guy, man, he's, it's rocking. He's healing. So the wife goes, um, he died. <laughs> not, not what he thought he would hear. I said, but I want you to know something. He said, when you came and prayed over my husband, he was angry, he was bitter, he was a miserable human being to be around because he was blaming God for everything. The last week of his life, the last week of his life were the best weeks we ever had in our marriage. We prayed together, we sang together, we laughed together. And then she says, my husband was not cured, but he was healed. My brother was not cured, but he was healed. God's always going to do what he's going to do for his people. But he's invited you and I into this journey. Brokenness is not in God's plan. And I think for a lot of us, for most of us, we say we believe. We say we have a relationship with God. How is God backing that up through your life? I've known far too many believers in the years I've been in ministry. I've been doing this since I was 16 who say they believe, but there's nothing in their life that they don't serve, they come to be served. And if that's you, this isn't the church for you. We're a church that serves. Not for us, but we serve to impact our community for Christ, for His glory to impact the world. That's who we are. And our service backs up our words, because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. But, our, but with healing, when we go, God can't heal, I'm not going to be a part of it, I'm not going to ask anybody what's going on, I'm not going to lay hands on anybody, I'm not going to pray for them, then again, if our actions prove who God is, what better way to prove to the lost world that God is God and in control and that God hates injustice and hates sickness and that is not his plan than to lay your hands on somebody and take a risk that maybe God may do something. And it's going to be God doing it because God wants to do it. But the beauty of it is, is he uses us in that process. And I get it. There's not a person in this room, not a one that's good enough for God to use that way. But God chooses to use us because he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we are now the righteous of God. When God looks at us, he doesn't see the imperfection. He sees Jesus. And maybe sometimes we're missing it because we don't follow what Jesus said in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seeking you will find, knocking the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be opened. Maybe we just need to start asking, seeking, and knocking. And say, God, use me to make a difference in this world. God, if you want to heal somebody through me, I'm open to it. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then guess what? If the person's healed, it ain't about you. Don't come back here and go, I healed somebody because I'm looking at you. No, you didn't. I'm going to break you. I'm going to bust your little bubble. It's not you. You're just a conduit that God chooses to use. But are you going to be a conduit that God chooses to use? Again, let's just jump back and then we're in with this. Jesus said that we will do greater things. Either we believe that or he's a liar. 
There's no middle ground. Either you believe he's going to do better, greater things, which means he's going to do greater things in and through you, or he's a liar. Are you allowing him to do greater things? We talked last week about prophecy. Just if God lays somebody on your heart today that you feel like you need to encourage, even if you don't know who they are, you don't even know the name, God may say, hey, go to the person in the orange shirt. And you go over to the person in the orange shirt and say, hey, God told me to pray for you. And you, they go, if they go get weirded out and say, I'm going to pray for you anyway because God told me to. You're not, you're not losing anything by it. You're losing something by not doing it if God tells you to. And to lay a hand on somebody and say, hey, can I pray for you? God, heal this person? You're not losing anything by it. You're losing something by not doing it. Our prayer through this whole thing is, God, expand my vision, embolden my heart, and release your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Next week, we start a new series looking at the spiritual disciplines. And you go, well, that's a, that's a jump from naturally supernatural to this. Well, part of the reason we struggle is because we don't even understand how to do this, this thing we call Christianity. We don't know how to grow. In fact, I think the series title is Grow Up. Is that right? The Grow Up. How do you grow up so that when the, when the supernatural and the natural meet, you actually recognize it? How do you pray? How do you find margin in your life to where you can listen to what God's telling you to do? How do you find uh, serenity? How do you find, uh, how, how do you uh, pray? I mean, how do you, how do you read scripture? All these things that we're going to talk about so that we can live the naturally supernatural life. We're going to pray and then you're going to have an opportunity to continue to worship. You can worship where you are. We have communion. If you're a guest with us, the way we do communion is come and get the elements and you go back to your seat and you do it in your own time. We don't have any special way to do it the bible says and as often as you gather together do this in remembrance of me and so all we're asking is this when you go back today i I would just look if you're taking that then something supernatural has happened in your life god has changed you all right say god how can you use me to show your greatness in the lives of others and just pray over that and you take the elements, and then we're going to sing, and we're going to be out of here. Um, if you want us to pray for you this week, in the, the pocket of the chair there, there is a um, the side card at the bottom is a prayer request. Um, I, I'm so excited. Last week, almost everybody wrote their names so that we could send a card to you and say, hey, we just want you to know we're praying for you. Um, if you want to leave a pray, praise up on the wall back there, there's some cards over on the uh, offering box back here and some thumbtacks. You can write that out and post it up there because our prayer team, love to celebrate what God's done. So we're going to pray and then we're going to move around. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day and we thank you for your incredible love for us. And Lord, I'm always amazed at the fact that you choose to use me, an imperfect person, who, Lord, is a skeptic even when you do something great and I don't even understand it because in my own life I see you do it and I see it in somebody else and I go, really? And yet you do. And I think for most of us, we need to pray, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. And then we need to take some steps to learn to trust you more. Lord, it may be today that if we go to a restaurant to eat, that we just ask, we're going to say the blessing, can we pray for you? Is there anything we can pray for you? And just see what they say. And then pray for them. And maybe even in this room right now that God's laying somebody on your heart. And you need to go talk to them. You don't even know why you're talking to them. You don't even know what God's going to use that word for. But that you take a chance and you do it just and see what God does. Father, we want to continue to worship you as you speak to us right now. And that we're going to be obedient to do what you tell us to do. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're free to move around.
Jesus! 